Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. They were fired up to be here this Sunday morning. And I love the first service. Hey, uh, by the way, we just want to say welcome to South Point. If you're watching online, wherever you might be watching from, whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, or our website, we're so glad that you're with us today. Wherever you're from here in the room, we're glad that you showed up. This happens to be your first Sunday, whether you're in the room or online. Man, we are really glad that you chose to be with us. We hope to see you again next Sunday. Just by the way, so you know who I am, my name is Matt. I'm what they call a lead pastor. And today, we're actually going to talk about something that literally... It doesn't matter whether you're an atheist. It doesn't matter if you grew up with different faith. It doesn't even matter if you're a follower of Jesus. There is something that all of us want, whether you're online or listen, all of us want this thing right here. I'm going to put it up on the screen. This is, this is true no matter where you're at in life and no matter what you believe. And it's this right here. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's this. All of us, all of us want the world to be a... All of us want the world to be a better place. I haven't met a person that go, you know what? I'd really like the world to be worse off. I mean, no one ever says that. We want to be better at life. We want to have a better life. All of us. Regardless of where you're at in faith and regardless of where you're at in life, we all want the world to be better. I actually got to experience having a better life and the world being a better place. Maybe you don't know this about me, but uh, my biological mom died when I was nine. I went into the juvenile justice system at 12 and a half, um, and I ended up homeless at about 16 and a half. Uh, the foster home I got uh, put into, uh, they said they didn't want me anymore. I called my probation officer. He said, hey, if you find a place to live, you don't have to take a pee test. I said, deal. Um, and so I, I was homeless, and uh, I had been visiting a church a, a lot like South Point. It, it was a portable church, and it wasn't a denominational church. It was just a church that loved Jesus, and it was made up of a bunch of crazy people. Um, and the youth pastors there um, took me in, and they became my adopted mom and my adopted dad. And, and here, here's what is kind of shocking, because if you've ever met uh, my adopted dad, my adopted dad, I was 16 and a half, my adopted dad was 28 and he already had three little kids of his own. And so I didn't know this at 16 and a half, but my sisters were really, really little. So my mom worked inside the home and she didn't get a paycheck for that. My dad had a full-time gig that he worked lots of hours. Matter of fact, I didn't realize that it was so tight adding me to the family that my, that my, you know, my adopted dad, I think he already had a second job, but he had a second job. And what I remember about growing up is, is that we always had food on our table. We always had clothes on our back. We, we always had the things that we needed, not always the things we wanted. Did somebody say amen? But, but the things... That we needed. And, and here, here's what I discovered about me wanting the world to be a better place. It wasn't until I got older, became my own adult, which isn't living in your parents' house, it's paying for your own bills. You know, when I became an adult, lived on my own, had my own kids, it wasn't until then that I realized the price that my adopted mom and dad had paid to make the world a better place for me. And it leads me to a truth that I kind of discovered the hard way, but here's the reality. You already know this. You didn't need to come to church today. You already get this, and, and it's this truth right here. All of us want the world to be a better place, but life-changing impact isn't... Oh, I, no one's fired up today. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, <laughs> life-changing impact isn't what? It comes with a... Like, listen, my adopted mom took me in, and they made the world a better place for me, and it was free to me, but it came at a cost for them. And it got me thinking, why did it take me becoming an adult? Why did it take me becoming a parent? Why did it take me, fig why did it take me so long to figure out that life-changing impact really isn't free? It actually comes at a cost. And, and, and then as I began to think about it, I went, oh my gosh, I wonder if, if this has happened to other people because I don't know if you've noticed this, but I, whenever I look out at the world and it go, it's busted and broken, and anybody else look out at the world and go, it's busted and broken? Okay, two people, that's great. This is going to go over well. <laughs> like we look out at the world and we go, it's busted and broken. And here's what I've said. I said, someone should. And it got me thinking, how many times have you looked out at the busted and broken world and said, someone. <laughs> Man, first service, you guys are really starved. You know where this is going. <laughs> someone should do something. And then I, here's what I realized is that in saying someone should do something, well, it didn't end up the way that I thought. And it leads us to something that, like, listen, you've experienced, again, this is true, whether you have no faith, different faith, or you've been followed Jesus, it doesn't matter whether you're young or old or married or single or whether you're financially struggling or financially well off. We, we all know this truth, and it leads us to this truth right here. We're going to put it on the screen. Waiting for? 
Waiting for someone to do something ends up becoming that does anything. The reason the world stays busted and broken is because we all look around and you know what we say? We all say the same one, same thing. Somebody should do something and somebody ends up becoming nobody. And the world that we want to be in a better place stays busted and broken. And you might be asking, well, what, what does that have to do with me? Well, you're here sitting or watching online at this thing called South Point Church. And, and what does this mean for us? And so today, I, like, listen, I want to tell you, like, listen, what I'm about to tell you, like, you already know this. Like, you, 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 whether you're faith, like, you get this, right? But as it relates to us being, now listen, a church isn't a building. Somebody say amen. A church isn't an organization. Somebody say amen. A church is a community of people who have decided to follow Jesus and love their community on behalf of Jesus. And here, this truth, waiting for someone to do something, ends up becoming nobody. What does that mean for us? Well, it leads us to a truth that we need to say today, and it's this right here. It's impossible. It's impossible to build a church that changes the world and impacts eternity, but costs us. Like, here's what I know to be true. Whether you, whether you're an atheist, whether you don't have a different faith, no one wants to go to a church that's hypocritical. Somebody say amen. Nobody wants to go to a church that says we love God and love other people, but we do nothing about it. Listen, no one wants to go to that church. Everyone wants to go to a church that is changing the world and impacting eternity. But you know this and I know this because it's an undeniable truth that life change isn't free. It comes at a... So then it becomes impossible. It becomes impossible for us to bring heaven down on earth and to see hell emptied so people can know that there's a God who made them, a God who loves them, a God who died for them. It's impossible to build a church that changes the world but costs us nothing because no one wants to be a part of a hypocritical church. And here's what's amazing. Did you know how South Point got to where it is? It's because so many of you online, so many of you in the room are part of Team Someone where you financially partner, where you serve with your time, your talent, and your treasures so that we can make Jesus famous. And I thought about what are some ways that I could maybe convince you that you should join Team Someone? And then I realized, well, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> I, I shouldn't do that. Maybe what I should do is have people that are on Team Someone, matter of fact, tell you why they joined Team Someone. So a couple weeks ago, we got a group of people who financially partner with us and who sacrificially give and talked about what it looks like to be a part of Team Someone. So if you'll give your attention to the screens, let's hear from them. I think people think that they have to give 10% or nothing. You know, it's either it's either one or zero. And, and I think it's more like you just start giving, you go, well, that didn't hurt. And then you give some more and you go, that didn't hurt. But it's not about whether it hurts you or not. I think, and I really believe at South Point, we get to see the differences. Yeah. Something else, you often look at all the people in our church and you think, well, if everyone else is giving, then I should have to give. And they don't need my couple dollars. But the reality is, if we all do our part, when we all do our part, then we see movement. We see change. I know for me, it was just having a scarcity mindset and feeling like I worked so hard for this money that I need to just hold on to it so tightly. And then what I found, though, was that when we let go. When we open our hands, God opens his hands. We trusted that what you said you were doing was going to be done. And so when you see the, the impact in the community, it makes me want to give more because I want to see more done for the kingdom. We view it as a relationship between Jesus and us. And when you think about relationships, you always help out 
whenever the need is there. Whether it's serving, whether it's giving them money, whatever it happens to be. There's no way you can keep your hands closed and your wallet closed when the church is being guided in the way of giving back to the community, opening up your heart, embracing others and friendships and relationships the way that God uh, called us to do down here on this earth. Why would you keep your wallet closed? Because we have to reach outside the doors where we're sitting and learning about these things and actually act them out. You know, now it it is it is a relationship that you build because you know something's going to happen to it. It's you you feel like you you're contributing. Okay, you're not the consumer, right? Um, and so it's not just a, a to-do thing on your list to go do and then just mark off and then get to the next to-do list. It, we maximize our our money for the community for for doing mission and and put aside kind of our own needs. And I, I think that that's just a really amazing thing. And you, and you see it at work in the community when you demonstrate the love of jesus by giving them something or doing something for them not expecting anything back i mean one of the things that i i really liked was during the pandemic we were handing out tablets to children so that they could do remote learning right money was taken from the church when katrina wiped out new orleans you know those are the types of things that if people are aware of, they know that their money's not being wasted. It's going to help real human beings like every one of us sitting around the room. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's not just the outreach. I've had the privilege of watching this church help us, people who go here. I mean, help each other and love each other. And it is a very power, a powerful thing to watch. And I know that our contributions that we make go in part towards that. And so that's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Yeah. Knowing that I'm being obedient and stepping out on faith because I, I feel inclined to give to the mission of Christ. And so he's like, thank you for being the good steward over the finances that I gave you. Here is when I step in is when you're at the end of yourself and I can do my God thing. It is amazing. It is really amazing. To, to feel the fathership of, of God and not just him being your creator. I, I would say um, that it, it's not always easy and it can be scary. And if if you're struggling with that, take that into your quiet time um, with God, whatever that looks like for you. And, and ask that your eyes and ears be open and your heart open for the answer. Give a little bit, start small and grow your relationship with God and watch him be faithful to his word. Watch him be faithful to you. Watch him be your father and grow that trust with God. And then you'll start seeing God move on your behalf little bit by little bit and your heart will be compelled to give more. Your heart will be compelled to have you reach out and start to contribute to your church in your volunteering and in your relationships with one another. And all of that is going to help around you as a Christian where the fruits of the spirit will start flowing through you. So don't let money be the stopping point of growing your relationship with God. Start. Try it. What do you have to lose? Yeah. But what you have to gain is knowing that I'm being obedient to what God wants me to do. What you have to gain is seeing your money um, in the different areas of our church. That's how I know that where what I'm giving to is making a difference. And so I would just say, try it. If you take that first step and you trust him and you say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm, I'm not sure and I've not done this, at, but I'm going to trust you and, and see see what he does. I think uh, I heard a common theme uh, throughout the evening, but uh, Jesus uh, in Matthew says, uh, be careful because your heart is tied to whatever you give yourself to. Um, and I think what, we're, what, what I heard say is, if you could tell someone is this, if you, if you tie yourself to Jesus and, and, you, and, you, and you take that step of faith, you'll realize that your heart is connected to what you put first in, in your life. And, 
if you put him first, it deepens that relationship. And, and at the end, I think, you know, uh, our hope and our prayer is, is that we would make Jesus famous and that people would have a real relationship with him and uh, that real relationship would transform the way they live and the way they, they experience life. And it's more than just getting to a place, it's getting a place, heaven inside of us. Hey, I just want to say on behalf of all the changed lives over the decades, I want to say thank you to every single person that has partnered with us, either serving or giving. So those of you on the line, those in your room, I just want to say thank you for all that you do so that we can continue to make Jesus-led life change in our community. Now, I just want to say, I think it's really brave of people to get on a screen and talk, talk about giving, uh, and so I'm really thankful for that. We're actually in week three of a series called Ignite Impact, and we've said, really, this might be the second most important series um, in the life of the church, and the big idea behind this whole series that we've been talking about is kind of this truth I'm going to put up on the screen, and it's this right here. Our God-given mission has run into a spacious. And listen, our God-given mission is to intentionally connect the disconnected to Christ, to community, and a cause. But I don't know if you've noticed this. As we've continued to grow, we're running out of parking spaces. I don't know if you've seen how many kids are in the back, but our, our kids' spaces are overflowing. I don't know if you've noticed that if you come in a little bit late, it's hard to find a seat because we're running out of space. So our mission has run into a space issue. And here's the thing. Like, listen, doing nothing just bec becomes a no to the the people around us that God loves and wants to read. Listen, love means that we're not going to just avoid that. We're not going to just do nothing because doing nothing really is just a no to the people that God loves and wants to reach. And so the leadership at South Point Church said, listen, we're going to launch this initiative called Ignite Impact. It is a prayer led, which means you don't, you don't do something because Pastor Matt told you to do it. You do it because you talk to Jesus. Somebody smile and say amen. It's a prayer led generosity journey over 36 months that has three specific phases. And so each week we've kind of put on the screen. So if this is your first Sunday, you'll get kind of an input into it. And, and this is kind of what it looks like. And, and we're going to put it on the screen. And it's this right here. We've had all this rapid growth. And we believe that our rapid growth is more than just blessings to celebrate. It's a God-given trust that we're to be responsible for. So over the next four to eight months, we want to make some immediate expansion. We're going to expand a little bit in the back for our next gen. We want to put some more parking space so everyone can find a parking spot. And then in the 12 to 24 months, there's some things we said when we got in the building, we were functional but not finished that we need to complete. And then we'd like to prepare around 30 months to 36 months we'd like to prepare for a future edition that would handle long-term growth. And that would take about $2.25 million over the next three years above and beyond our budget. Now listen, here's, here, here's the, our operational budget. Here's the thing that you need to understand. If you miss week one or two, I really, really want to encourage you, whether you're online or in the room, please go back. You can go to our website, our YouTube channel, and catch up on demand there. Which kind of leads us back to now that we've kind of brought everyone up to speed is, is what we, the problem that we started with, and, and this is the problem that we started with, and we're going to put them on the screen, is, is listen, no one wants to be a part of a hypocritical church. None of us wants to be a part of a church that says we're going to love God, we're going to love others, but we're not going to actually do anything to make that happen. We're unwilling to pay the cost. And what I love is that this call to be on Team Someone is we see demonstrated in such a graphic way from one of the, the most unlikely, I mean, this, this guy was one of the most unlikely disciples that there were. And we see this in the eyewitness account. We, we see this recorded through all history in the Gospel of Luke. And, and we're going to put it up on the screen. It's, it's Luke. We're going to put it up here. And it's Luke 5. And it says this. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. Follow me, he said to him, and he got up and followed him, leaving everything behind. Now, in those three sentences, you and I in our modern history, we don't see the impact. We don't see the life. We don't see the impact of this because when I say tax collector, you think of an IRS agent, right? You think of an IRS agent, just, you know, somebody you don't like, but just a decent person doing their job. Listen, in those days when it says Jesus went out and saw a, you need to put in Nazi collaborator, that is the emotion and the visceral. You have to understand the nation of Israel had been conquered, raped, and pillaged by the foreign army, the Roman army. And if you were a tax collector, you collaborated with the enemy to pay for their army to continue to conquer you, and you got wealthy by robbing your own people. You were the worst of the worst. Now, Jesus was considered a rabbi. And so you have to understand, in Jewish culture, the greatest thing that you could ever become was a rabbi, and the second best thing that you could ever do was be called by a rabbi to follow them. 
So we don't know what happened to Levi that he would become a collaborator, that he would rob from his own people and support the armies that had raped and pillaged his home. But whatever it led to, he was what was wrong. And then Jesus showed up to make the world a better place to bring the kingdom up there, down here. And can you imagine this collaborator's awk, shaw, awk, uh, shock and awe when Jesus calls him? He leaves everything. You mean I get to follow a rabbi? And everyone's amazed at this. Jesus made the world a better place with his encounter with Levi. But that's not the end. We see how Levi is changed because Jesus made his life better. By the way, it was gonna cost Jesus something to make Levi's life better. Matter of fact, it cost Jesus his reputation. He was called a friend of sinners. Aren't you glad? You hang out with those wine bibbers and tax collectors. Aren't you glad? And it would eventually cost him his life because of all the sin and all the mistakes that Levi had made. Jesus was going to pay that penalty on the cross. And he wouldn't stay dead on a cross or dead in a tomb, but the tomb was empty on the third day. So what was free to Levi would cost Jesus something. But, but what happened to Levi? Like what, what happened to his life? What, what was this transformation? We see Levi. The next verse we see this is so cool. Look at this. It says, then Levi gave a, what's the word? Not a lame. <laughs> Notice it doesn't say Levi gave a lame banquet for Jesus. Now I'm going to stop here. I'm going to preach and I'm going to offend some people. Because here's what I understand. Nike will spend billions of dollars so that you'll spend money with them. Apple will spend billions of dollars to get you to spend your money with them. But when it comes to the church, we'll complain that we spend money to reach people with the only thing that will give them life. Notice that Levi didn't throw a lame banquet. He threw a... He threw a great banquet in his house for? Did you notice the connection? The greatness was tied to Jesus. He did this not because of his friends to make them impressed. He didn't do this to earn his way to heaven. He didn't do this. He did this for Jesus. He saw how great Jesus was, and he wanted to honor Jesus. Then Levi gave a great banquet in his house for Jesus, and there was a large crowd of collaborators and others sitting at the table. You know, the only people that would hang out with the collaborators were, were the wild and crazy. I mean, think of like whatever happens in Vegas, you actually take home with you. All those things. Think about it. Levi's life had become better because of Jesus. And so what did he do? Well, he wanted to make the world a better place. And so he was willing to pay the cost to have this great banquet so that his friends could see that there's a God who sees them, that they could see that Jesus saw them. And as much as he did it for them, he did it to honor Jesus. And it got me thinking. I want you to picture this. Do you think this banquet was the worst day of his life or one of the best days of his life? I mean, think about it. This guy had been robbing his own people, so worried about himself, so corrupted that all he could do was steal. And in a moment, Jesus came and changed his life. And I bet as the banquet was happening and he saw his friends having fun and he saw Jesus meeting them and them getting to meet Jesus, I bet he said, I can't believe I get to be with the rabbi. Do you think that he was over in the corner going, I hope I didn't spend too much. I hope, oh, I hope they don't eat the best sheep. I hope they stopped eating or drinking. It was probably one of the most joyful days of his life that he could do something to make Jesus famous to his friends. He knew that life change, significant life change, wasn't free. Someone had to pay for that meal and that space. Someone had to pay for the banquet to be great for them to see Jesus. And what I love is I bet Levi wasn't sad or mad. I bet it gave him great joy to have the privilege for his friends to see Jesus in such a great way. And you know, Levi actually saw Jesus model this. And not only did Jesus model sacrifice, matter of fact, Jesus says that's what it means to follow him. We see it in his own words. We see it in the gospel of Mark 10, 45. We see it here. It says this, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to, and to, 
Listen, I, I, just, I just got some news for y'all. This is going to be so good. You're going to be so glad you came today. No, you're not. See, I think oftentimes we come to church and we hope we get power, privilege, and prestige. And I want you to know followers of Jesus aren't in the power, privilege, and prestige business. Because you know what followers do? Followers follow. <laughs> Jesus came to serve and to sacrifice. Now, here comes the news that you've probably never, ever heard a preacher say, like, you should get fired up. Like, you've never heard this in a church. Did you know that the scripture actually tells you that you shouldn't give or serve under certain circumstances? So if you're here today going, oh, I hate it. I showed up on the wrong side. Listen, I got good news. You're going to hear something for the first time ever in church that you shouldn't give or serve under these circumstances. Like, I'm going to tell you to don't do that. Like, are you fired up, Right. I mean, we see this in the Corinthians, the apostle Paul, like he used to kill Christians until he encountered a risen Jesus. And there's a church in the city of Corinthians that it was a lot like us. It was made up of different ethnicities, different ages, people who had no church, people who had come from pagan backgrounds, but they were all trying to follow Jesus, right? And he writes this to them in Corinthians. And here's what it says. We're going to put it on the screen. You must each decide in your, your heart. Like that, that's between you and Jesus, not between Pastor Matt and you. Somebody say Amen. Each of you must decide in your heart how much to. I mean, because it was assumed that like if Jesus served and gave, then his followers would serve and. See, it didn't hurt, it didn't hurt you to say that, did it? No money magically flew out of your wallet. By the way, we're not going to take an offering. You're good. How much to give? And don't give. Do you read it? And what does it say? And don't give Good news, if you're online and you're in the room and you feel reluctant, then God is saying, don't, don't do that. Or in response to pressure. Listen, it should never be about shame or guilt. Like, listen, if you feel shame or guilt or you feel pressure or you feel reluctant, the scripture literally tells you, have you ever heard that in church before? <laughs> Get fired up. If you are reluctant and you feel pressure, then you shouldn't give. For God loves a person who gives. Levi was fired up that the God who saved him would choose to use him to bring up there, down here. And so when he gave the great banquet, I don't think he was reluctant. I don't think he felt pressured. I think he felt it was a privilege to use all that God had given him to make glory for Jesus. And this idea of not giving reluctantly or response to pressure isn't something just in the New Testament. It's been around since the beginning. We see this in Deuteronomy. We're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this right here. Honor the Lord your God. So listen, I just want to say something. If you're here, you're not a follower of Jesus, you just get to eat popcorn. Right? Like you just, like just, but if you are a follower of Jesus, I just want you to know something. Everything you have is a gift from God. It's not yours. It belongs to him. And someday we're all going to stand before God and we're going to give account for the resources that we used. Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> Honor the Lord your God. Bring him a... If you feel pressured or you feel reluctant, don't give. You just heard it in church. You're allowed to repeat it back. Don't give because it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a response to God's goodness and grace. In, it's not asking you to give what you don't have. It's saying in proportion to what you do have, to the blessings you have received from him. So what does it look like for you, for I? If we're followers of Jesus, for followers of Jesus, what, what does that practically look like for us to make the world a better place? And really, we just see from that passage and we see from scriptures, there's, there's three things that God teaches you and I. And, and we're going to put them on the screen. They're, they're so simple. Like, listen, they're not rocket science. They're just so simple. It's just easy. Ready? Jesus is our, like, Jesus is our example. Like, like, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus left the comfort of heaven. He came in a human suit. And he didn't care about his reputation. He served and he sacrificed because of something like, listen, you already get this, right? Genuine love is willing to sacrifice. Genuine love is always willing to sacrifice. Genuine love is unwilling to do nothing. 
true, true, true story. True story. Uh, years ago, I, I have three daughters, and, and one of my daughters, uh, she got the bug, and she got the bug where it was coming out both ends, if you know what I'm saying. Like, I know it's been bug season, but if they got any pears now, she knew what I'm talking about. And so uh, our girls were little. I don't remember if my wife was working part-time or, or she was just working inside the home. But uh, the first time uh, we heard her get up, and I mean, you could just hear it, and she knocked the door, and she just, it was just horrible. And so my wife said, hey, you got to work tomorrow. I'm going to go get it. So my wife got up, and, and she did it. I heard her, like, you know, do all the stuff and put my daughter in the shower. And, and then she put her back to bed, new sheets. You know, my wife's amazing, right? She puts her back to sleep, right? And I can hear her get back into bed. I'm like, whew, thank God that's over, okay? And, I'm going to go back to sleep. And the next thing in about five minutes later, blah, and then all the other things I'm not going to go into, right? And I hear him knock on the door, and, and, and she puts him in. I realize that the second time, I have a choice. Dads, I'm just trying to help us out right now. I had a choice in this moment. I could either say I love my wife, or I could show her that I loved her. Because love is unwilling to do and so I got up and I helped clean up, throw up, and poop because I didn't want my wife to do it all by herself because I love my daughter and I love my wife. God the Father looked and saw us lost and broken and separated from him. And love meant he wasn't going to do nothing for God so loved the world that he... I, I'm confused. Followers of Jesus would be the most generous people because we're just following Jesus as our followers follow. Love is our motivation. It's not guilt. I'm not paying to get my way into heaven. I'm not paying. I'm not giving a dollar so God will give me 10. We hear preachers like that all the time. Give them one and God will give you a 10. That's just called greed. It's idolatry. That's not what we're supposed to do. It's not about earning our way. It's not about shame. It's not about guilt. It's not about getting back. Love is our motivation that God rescued us. I love how uh, Pastor Tracy says it, our worship pastor. She says it's a privilege and an honor to give back to God who gives everything to us. True, true story. Uh, I have a sister, and my sister lived in North Carolina, and she needed to move, and my dad told me that he was going to go down and help her move, and when my dad told that, I was freaked out because my dad had just had a heart attack, and so I said, let me get this right, Dad. You're going to hop in your car. You've just had a heart attack. You're going to drive for you know four or five hours. You're going to move stuff in the hot North Carolina sun and then move it into another place and then get in a car and drive back all in one. That sounds like a horrible idea. Now, if you need to know something, I hate helping people move. I put holes in people's walls. They never asked me to help move again. But I love my dad and I love my sister. And so I didn't move, help them move because I was guilted or shamed in it. I love my dad. I love my sister. I gave of my time and resources because was the motivation. The reason that we give back to God is not shame or guilt or earning, but because we love the God who gave everything for us, and it's a privilege to reflect his generosity to the world around us, because no one wants to be a part of a church that is hypocritical and says, we love you and love God, we're just not willing to do anything about it. And in short, what happens when we don't sacrifice and serve is we basically say we don't give a damn, Right? Ability is our indicator. What I love about South Point Church is we're made up of all kinds of people from all different kinds of background. We're really diverse. So excited, and thank you for being a part. We have some people here making minimum wage, barely scraping through life. We have some people here. We're the 15th wealthiest county in the country. So we have a broad spectrum. So ability is our indicator. When my girls were little, both two of my little girls, they, they played kitty soccer. You ever seen kids play kitty soccer? It's the cutest and scariest thing at the same time. You're like, those are the future leaders of the world? 
but it's so cute, right? So I remember when my daughters were, were little and they played little kitty kick soccer, right? Now I coached high school soccer. I know how the soccer field is supposed to look. I know what the goals are like. There's these standards that you're supposed to have for soccer. And when I went to the little kid soccer, it was very different. The field was shorter. They had different roles. There wasn't as many kids on the thing, right? And they had different goals because they needed them to play to their... So they changed the way it looked so that they could play within their ability. Matter of the the scripture that we read that says you should give voluntary and in proportion. So some of you, if we invite you to participate with us, your participation might be you give up Starbucks once a week. That $8 drink becomes $40 that you give a month. For others, did you know the median household joint income in St. Mary's is over $120,000? Your proportion or ability is a lot higher than $8 a week. And the real thing is that's not even between me and you. It's between you and God. And so to build a church that impacts eternity and it changes the world, to be a church where we're not hypocritical, well, that doesn't come at the cost of nothing. And so what does that look like? Well, Jesus is our example. Love is our motivation and ability is our indicator. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road because we're out of space, right? And so we, we got to do something. And so like, there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow to create more space. And so listen, if you're a first time guest or, or, or you're not a follower of Jesus, I just want you to go like, this ass that I'm about to make is not for you. But if you are a follower of Jesus and you consider South Point your home, well, then I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask, would you prayerfully consider financially partnering above and beyond our operating budget for the next 36 months to help pay to create for more space? Matter of fact, I'm going to put something scary, like don't freak out. Don't freak out. It's okay. I'm going to put something scary on here, okay? Okay, right here. Okay, we're going to put up a screen right here, okay? Oh! Over the last several weeks, and when you come in, we've given out brochures that explain this in details, and in there is a planned giving card. And, and people always ask me, Pastor Matt, why do churches need a planned giving card? Is it like, is it like, a, is it like a legal binding thing? Is it like something you And the answer is no. It's none of those things. All it lets us know is planned giving allows us to plan our spending so we are wise and honor Jesus with our resources. That's all it is. It just lets us know what you plan on giving so we can appropriately plan our spending because we don't want to be the church that gets in trouble for spending money they don't have. Somebody say amen. So we have these planned giving so we know who our partners are so we can plan that appropriately. And so here's what we'd ask. Now you can fill this out online. You can fill this out in person, but here's what we're hoping. Starting tomorrow, Monday, that you would either digitally fill these out, mail them in, or specifically that if you're going to be in person, you would bring them back Next Sunday, it's so easy. You just kind of fill out your information, right? And say, listen, here's what I'm going to give over the next 36 months. Here's my giving plan. It says weekly, monthly, yearly, one time. Like you get to pick. That's between you and Jesus, right? And then you turn that in and that just lets us know how to plan our spending. And some people have asked me, what's this Kickstarter offering? And I say, listen, have you ever gone to buy a house or buy a car, right? Like, you know, that's a pretty big thing. They often ask that you would put a down payment. So Kickstarter offering is, is this $2.25 million over the next 36 months? Well, that, that's a lot of resources. And so we'd like to kick that off and ask everybody if they'd be, be willing to give a one-time gift between next Sunday and the end of March. Now, the giving won't start until April. So the planned giving for the 30 months, 36 months will start in April, and our Kickstart offering will happen through the end of March. And so this is, this is like a you and God thing. This isn't like guilt. Remember, if you feel reluctant, don't give. If you feel pressured, don't give, because God loves a cheerful giver. Love is our motivation, and ability is our indicator. Which leads us to sum something up, and it's this right here. I'm going to put it on the screen. Jesus followers are called to be a part of team. Now, for you, that may be with a different organization. For you, it may be with a different church. For you, it may be somewhere else. I don't know where God is calling you. But all I can ask is that you would prayerfully consider what God is asking you to do to partner with us. Because of something that we said, it was so obvious. Creating and building a church that impacts eternity 
and changes the world can't be built for nothing. That's impossible. I want to close with a, with a true story. Happened literally just like last week. So I've been going to the same gym for about a day, for longer than a decade, man. Like it's, it's changed owners so many times, I, I can't remember, right? But like, I've been going to the same gym and I don't know if you've ever noticed this. You have what you call gym friends. Anybody ever got gym friends? You see them in the gym, you know their name, you wave at them, you talk to them, but you never see them outside the gym. Every once in a while, your gym friend will become a friend that you know that actually becomes a friend outside the gym. But like, there's the same squad. So this was a gym friend. We don't hang outside the gym, but I was working out and you know, every once in a while, they'll spot me and I'll spot him. And so he comes over to me, he goes, Matt, I go, what? He's like, dude, like my girlfriend and I, we started watching your series online. I was like, oh, that's pretty, like shock. Like I was just, you know, cool. Try not to ruin it because when people know you're a pastor, they treat you really differently, right? So I was just glad he was talking to me, you know? I'm like, cool, man, that's really good. He's, yeah, yeah. He's like, hey, we're, we're thinking about coming and visiting the church. I was like, cool. And he's like, hey, I, how does your church work? Like, do you speak and then somebody else speak? Because I want to come to the one you speak. I see you on video. I want to come see you. And I go, hey, don't worry, man. When I'm on on a Sunday, I speak both at 9 11. You can come to whichever service. He's like, cool, man, we'll come sometime. I was like, that's great, man. Love to have you. Whenever you want to come, come as you are. We're, we're pretty chill. You can just, you know, we don't care what you wear as long as you wear something. (laughs) What happens when someone like him who's giving God, Jesus, and church one last chance and there's no parking spaces, there's no spaces for their kids, and there's no spaces in the auditorium. And I don't know about you, but I'm unwilling to do nothing about that. I believe the life change that God has given us has come directly from him. And we're to be responsible for that. South Point stands at a crossroads where we're gonna choose the comfort of success. Hey man, it's good for me. There's a space for me. There's a chair for me. My kids got it. Or we're gonna choose the call to sacrifice to make it good for others. And here's what I love, is that God isn't finished. South Point's best days are not behind us, but they're in front of us. And that I believe that we're a community that will continue to make Jesus famous in our community. Would you stand? In a moment, after the worship team leads us in a song, we're going to have an opportunity to take communion And I don't know if you know this, but communion is for Jesus followers, and it's a reminder of the price and the sacrifice. And if you didn't get this when you came in, there's ushers. If you raise their hand, they'll make sure that you get it. But if you would hold on to this, and after the worship song, we're going to take this together. Let me pray. Hey, God, thank you that love motivated you to do something, that you saw that we were busted and broken. And that what's wrong on the outside starts with what's wrong on the inside. And you sent your one and only son who lived a perfect life, who willingly went to a cross and paid our penalty and was buried in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, he conquered hell and death. You paid the price so we could be set free and whom the son set free is free indeed. God, may love and joy fill our hearts to make you famous in our communities. Thank you that what's free to us costs you everything. Help us to follow Jesus' example. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name and all who agreed said, amen.